Oh, that was weak. Everybody's asleep. Good morning, GCC. I know there's like half of us here this morning because I know we're all traveling, but man, that was, that was good and strong. I'm glad I woke you up. That's awesome. That's actually where I want to begin this morning. I want to begin with what's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? So for some of you, coffee. I a thousand percent agree with that. Yeah. Um, for some of you, that's a nice big bowl of Wheaties maybe, right? You're thinking about um, whatever you're eating for breakfast. For me, my breakfast consists of exactly what Myra just said, a nice tall cup of coffee. That's a beautiful breakfast every single morning that I, I love to enjoy. For some of you, that may be putting on your, your full jumpsuit and your, and your runners and going for a 30-mile run. I envy you if you actually do that. I'm just saying. I don't do that. That's just total, like, I hope that that happens eventually. But what happened in October of 2018, early October of 2018, was there was a gentleman by the name of Jameson Key who gave me a phone call early in the morning and asked about what I assume was the first thing he thought about in the morning, which is kind of strange, a haunted house. He gave me a phone call and it basically went something like, hey Titus, can I do a haunted house? To which I was like, absolutely. Absolutely you can do a haunted house. They're the best and you're doing it at church. It'll be weird, but it'll be cool. So Jameson gets gets the permission from me, I, I didn't know I gave permission to people, but I did in, that, in this sense, and he, he had the permission to do this haunted house. A week goes by, maybe a week and a half goes by, and then I walk over from the office over to the main building, per his request, and on the young adult whiteboard, I see this. Daunting, I know. That was a great response, whoever said that. Oh, yeah. Now, for like 20% of this room, and I'm talking about like David Palmer, uh, Greg Harlan, John Kinzorski, like you guys look at that and go, oh, I can do that, that's no problem. I can probably build that with just the resources in here. And to you, I say, that's awesome. To the other 80%, I agree with you. What is going on here? That's a lot of information. But whenever I saw this on the board, my first thought was, I am absolutely perplexed. My second thought was, wow. What a gift, like what a gift that there are people in the world who can think like in a 3D spatial way and like come up with a plan and then execute it. And he executed it well. That's what I think at least, right? Skip on back to 2017. Uh, The youth group started this tradition that I kind of started where we like to climb up Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain is a great little exercise that gets teens' bloods pumping, right? They can get up to the top of the mountain no problem. It's a little harder for some of us, and it's getting harder every year. And I know I'm young, but it's, it's getting harder every single year. That's embarrassing. But anyways, um, our first year that we actually peaked at the top of the mountain, there's this little coin right at the top of it that says Stone Mountain, United States Geological Survey, whatever, so many thousand feet. You guys have probably seen this before, right? It's sitting on the top. I like to at least think that's where the top of the mountain is, right? That's my cute little idea. I don't know if that's true or not. The first year, we took this picture. I don't have a picture of it. Emily does, and I didn't get it in time. But there's this picture of all of us with our feet like this, making a circle around the cute little circle. You guys have seen this on Instagram or Facebook before, right? It's, really, it's, a, it's a cute picture. It's a super cute picture. So we took it the first year. The second year, 2018, we went back to Stone Mountain. Oh, it skipped the wrong way. That's, that's, this, that's, that's skipping ahead. Oh, well, that, there's the picture. Thank you back there. This was the picture right before we decided to summit in 2018. 2018 was kind of a flop because we weren't able to find the little coin on top. So this is all their smiling faces before we kind of were a little upset and weren't able to find the coin. Fast forward to 2019 when we went this year, this, this summer, and we're up there. There's... Just imagine this picture. There's 15 to 20 like young adults, youth group kids, and adults looking around for the, this, this little coin. We looked ridiculous. We looked absolutely ridiculous, right? We look like we're Velma and Scooby-Doo trying to find their glasses. So we're up there, and there's this sweet lady who's walking her dog. By the way, the people who decide, oh yeah, I'm just going to walk up Stone Mountain, they're crazy. But that was one, she was one of those people, right? So she sees us up top and she says, the logical question, what in the world are you doing? (laughs) So I just told her, yeah, we're looking for this coin. And as soon as I start to describe it, she's like, oh yeah, it's right there. (laughs) 
And I was like, thank you so much. Last year we couldn't find it. She's like, well, you couldn't find it? There's four of them. <laughs> so we took the picture. We were able to actually take the picture. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. We were able to take the picture. And here's the picture. There it is, boom. We were able to take this picture, but we were only able to take it because this kind lady decided to help us. And that was such a gift, you know, like being able to take this picture, being able to have this memory as a youth group was, was great, right? Coming back to waking up early in the morning, some of you guys probably remember a time where alarm clocks weren't a thing, right? There, were, there was a time where alarm clocks were simply just the analog clock with the two bells on top and the little thing that went back and forth, right? And then we've kind of transitioned into this era where we have all these alarm clocks that can do crazy things like read you the weather and it connects to your phone and, and does all this stuff. This is my personal favorite one. This one doubles as a bat signal. So if, you are, if you're Batman and you need to get up in the morning, you know exactly what time it is when you're going to go save Gotham. It's 1234. It's awesome, right? I love that. But that wasn't always the case. There was a time back in London, of all places, where there was a person that you paid every single morning to wake up in the early hours of the morning. We're talking three, four, five in the morning, right? You, didn't, you had this problem because you didn't want to wake up the whole block of people, but you needed to be up early enough in the morning. Anybody ever wondered like, what they did? Here's what they did. This is mind-blowing. They had this guy who would stand with this long pole. Sometimes it reached... One story up, sometimes it reached two, three, four stories up. Long cane pole on the end is a little hook, almost like a hanger hook, right? And it's super scratchy. So he would scratch, scratch, scratch on the, on the old Victorian era windows. And it's, I've heard it's like nails on a chalkboard, right? Terrible way to wake up. A worse way to wake up is this lady right here. This lady right here has a little pea shooter that she would load with frozen peas and then hit your window and it sounded like bombshells going off. It's ingenious though because it solves this problem of that we have now with alarm clocks that we don't have to worry about. It's on our phones now, right? Back then, that was what they had to do. But it's something that we do every single day. We, every person wakes up, I assume, every single day. You're all here, so that's, that's something, right? But it was different back then. And we have this gift of alarm clocks, and we use it every day, and we probably don't notice it either. Another thing that I like to, I like to always pay attention to, the first time I saw this, because I'm, I'm a small town boy, I, I don't know the city life that much. Uh, whenever I came up to OC, I mean, I've been to the mall before, right? It's not like I'd never been to the mall before. But when, when I moved up to OC and started hanging out with Emily, because that's about the same time that we met, um, I noticed things just differently than she did, Right? So this is one of the things that just perplexes me, and I just think this is brilliant. When you walk into the mall when it's raining, this is what you'll see. Anybody ever seen this before? Yeah, Mall of Georgia, you see this a lot, right? When it's rainy, which it rains a lot here, so you guys are like, oh yeah, that's old hat. In Oklahoma, it doesn't rain a lot, so that rarely comes out, right? But the first time I saw that, I was thinking, wow. They had this problem of people awkwardly dripping their umbrellas in through the mall, and they fixed it with that. How cool is that, right? Interesting little things like that. Another one that I, I assume a lot of you have seen before and been perplexed by, how many, of you, have, how many of you guys have been to Chick-fil-A and seen this up on the wall in the bathroom and thought, what is going on here? That right there is a mouthwash, mouthwash station. Why does Chick-fil-A need a mouthwash station, you ask? I'm glad that you asked. Let me tell you my theory. I think that Chick-fil-A is trying to get a corner on the Christian dating market. And this is the beginning of their plan. It's genius. Follow me on this, okay? You're a teenage boy. You're on your first date. Where do you go? Chick-fil-A. Great choice. Great choice. Amazing sandwiches, great customer service, pretty nice ambiance. You can get in, get out, no problem, right? And you can go do something else. You can go mini golf. You can go see a movie. You have plenty of time because it doesn't take up a lot of time. So you're there. You're eating your Chick-fil-A sandwich, which I'll admit doesn't really give you bad breath, so I don't really know what's going on there. But your sweetheart goes to the bathroom. Of course, it's time for breath check. <sighs> oh, it's bad. It's real bad. It's bad. So she comes back, oh, you know what? I need to go to the restroom. You walk into the restroom and you're thinking the entire time, what am I going to do? 
what am I going to do? You're looking in the mirror, you're doing your hair 30 times, you're, you're adjusting your coat. You look over to your left, the mouthwash station. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's there. But it's the little things. It's the little things that are happening all around us, all the time, and we never really notice them, right? They're kind of whizzing past us as fast as we can, and we're not really paying attention to them. And that's why I think where we run into this problem where we have all these little things that happen to us or the things that we take advantage of all of the time. It's happening all the time. And if you made a list of them, it would probably make you go crazy, right? But here's the thing. We're not even thinking about being thankful for a single one of them. And that's a problem. And it's a similar problem that we're going to talk about this morning. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. This is actually the same passage that we talked about in class, so this is going to work beautifully. Turn with me to Luke 17. It's also going to be up on the screen. Luke 17 beginning, oh wait, wait. (laughs) We'll come back to that. Luke 17 beginning in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they, as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to himself, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So to backtrack a little bit, um, when I was six, I had the opportunity to have the greatest birthday party of all time. Let me set the scene for you, all right? Duncan, Oklahoma, south side of town. Not, not the, really the great part of great part of town. I mean, that doesn't really matter. The bowling alley. The bowling alley was a magical place. Still is a magical place. It's wonderful, all right? Let me tell you why. It's kind of vintage, but it's well-maintained, right? You know what I'm talking about? Everything's kind of old, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all falling apart, right? You can definitely still bowl some great games there. The arcade is rocking. The pool tables are well-maintained. The only thing that's weird is the weird cafeteria-like little area where you buy, you can buy the the greasiest pizza in all of Grady County and the worst fries that taste like they were baked in the sun for 30 days. It's terrible, right? But that was irrelevant. My six-year-old self, it was about to turn into my seven-year-old self, was over the moon when my mom told me that we're going to the bowling alley. So we're in that little cafeteria area that I was telling you about, right? And we, happy birthday to you, all that fun stuff. Birthday cake's in front of me. I blow out the candles, have my wish and all that stuff. It gets moved away. It's getting cut up. Mom hands me the first gift. Now, this gift was from a friend of mine from church, which I'm in a small town, so everyone goes to church and everyone goes to school, so you know how that is. So, this friend of mine, his name was Samuel. Samuel was a great kid. Still is a great guy. I don't know him that well anymore, but he was, he was fantastic. Had a different life than I did, though. I uh, grew up in a very different situation, lower economic situation. His dad was a farmer. He helped in the farm all the time. I mean, he was at school, but just barely. You know, he's one of those kids because he was working all the time. So he gets to my birthday party, and he decided to give me this gift right here. Now, this gift is a wonderful gift by all accounts. Let me tell you why. This is a blue monster truck. It's basically a, a monster truck that was brought down to play toy size. It's a great size. It, it's one of those that you bring it back and then it launches like the speed of sound. It doesn't take much to actually make it go, but it was built Ford Tough. It's wonderful. I love that little truck, right? Didn't at the time because when I open the bag, I remove the, the wrapping. I looked down into the, into the bag and saw what it was. I looked up at him and I said, and this is terrible, this isn't what I wanted this is what you wanted. I don't want to be your friend anymore. Surrounded by church people. My mom was so happy. No, she she took me and grabbed me and threw me outside, stuck a finger in my face, and I'm so glad she did. And she said, don't ever be ungrateful. 
or at least don't be ungrateful on purpose. These people that Jesus is dealing with in this passage, they're ungrateful, but at least, at least they're better than I am. They, they weren't ungrateful on purpose, right? But is it any better? Not really. I guarantee you, in this society, having leprosy was something that you, if you walked away able to join your family, you'd be thankful. You know what I mean? You're able to be part of the community again. You're able to go to church again. You're able to be part of your family and just have a, have a job. It's better than rotting outside. Jesus healed 10 people, and nine of them walk away. The interesting thing about this passage, too, is it's, it's very short, which, which you guys probably noticed already, and it doesn't really give us a lot of detail, but it doesn't need to. We have these 10 people, and it, it, we don't really need to know much more about them other than one of them was a Samaritan. Now, the interesting thing about this, if you remember in the first verse, it says Jesus is passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee, right? So, if Jesus is passing really close to Samaria, and this guy's a Samaritan, why does he call him a foreigner? We're right close to his hometown. What's going on there? Well, it's partly because you notice the nine immediately went to the priest when Jesus told them to do that? That's because they knew their Bible. They knew Leviticus 13. They knew that, that the priest was going to be able to say, yeah, you're good. Go in peace, right? Go, go join the community. They were excited about that. They kind of had this transactional attitude where they were like, thank you. Have a nice day. I'm going to the priest. I'm going to go see my family. This guy didn't know that. This guy didn't know that. And so he sees the receipt that Jesus gives him and goes, oh my goodness, this is so incredibly valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much. And bows down before him and praises him. These, these guys, these nine that walked away, they were good people. They wanted to join their families. They saw the value of it. They just didn't do anything about it. So, this is really kind of what happens here, and this is kind of the drumbeat of the book of Luke, actually, is the ignorant outsider, the person who doesn't belong, is more grateful and shows up the knowledgeable insiders. The people who are supposed to know what's, what's going on, and, and they probably even did. They probably have a closer relationship to God. They don't get it as much as the people who are on the outside who don't fully get it. Awkward. <sighs> Ouch right? I think often when we, when we talk about Thanksgiving, we, we do this wonderful exercise, and we even did it this morning, and it's a wonderful exercise to do, and that is, what are you thankful for? That's a wonderful exercise to do. Counting your blessings, I'm a firm believer. I'm a firm believer in counting your blessings. I don't know how many of you guys have done that before. If you haven't, Drop what you're doing and do that right now. Stop listening to me and just do that, like honestly. <laughs> Grab a pen and paper, do it. Open up your, your notes app. Just write down as many things as you can think of that you're thankful for, and it will surprise you. You're not going to have enough space. You're just not going to have enough space, right? Because you can do it. You can be as specific as possible, and it, you, it's just, it's insurmountable, the amount of things that God and other people have done for us. Other people being the vehicle for God and then God himself doing things for us. But here's the thing. Here's the kicker. Giving pause is not enough. I think what, what, what often can happen whenever we, we have Turkey Day is uh, it, st it can stay here. And there's nothing wrong with us thinking deeply and theologically and thinking about all the great things that have happened. But the last thing I want us to do is to keep it here. So giving pause is not going to cut it. It's got to transition into something more. Let me give you an example. Right now, and I think you guys will agree with me, the thing that I'm the most excited about, the thing that I'm the most thankful for, is the fact that that, that little dot right there, has turned into that, and guess what? She's bigger than that right now than she is on the screen. Can I get an amen? Yeah. That's what I'm thankful for right now. That's what I'm thankful for. But here's the thing. 
I'm thankful for that. Don't hear, don't hear me wrong on that. But it's changing everything. I mean, it's changing everything. And you guys are like, oh, yeah, you don't even know. You don't even know. You guys would, would <laughs> I've heard that so often. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, sure, you don't even know. <laughs> and it's true. But, I mean, it's, it's changing the way that I think about my time, right? It's changing the way that I think about how I, how I spend money, even right now, because I want to be able to save up and have, so she can have the best life that she's ever even, she didn't even know that was possible, right? Um, it's, it's changing the way that I, that I love Emily. I know that may sound weird, but, like, it's changing, like, I know that I'm going to have to have more room in my heart for this girl, so I've got to make more room for Emily so that way she's not picking up, and she's not getting just seconds. You know, I don't want that to happen. So it's just changing so many different parts of my life, and it's not just me being thankful for it and going, mm, yes, yes, I am thankful for that. Cool, right? It's, it's, it's got to impact my life. It's got to. <laughs> it's got to. Um, this may seem absolutely random, and it is. It's intentionally random. Uh, how many of you guys have ever heard of the game Don't Wake Daddy? Those of you with kids, you're like, I have. <laughs> Don't Wake Daddy is the most terrifying board game on the market, and it's not even close. And let me tell you why. The game begins like this, with daddy asleep, where he belongs, where he belongs. For you to win the game, daddy needs to stay asleep. The point of the game, I don't know if this has a pointer or not, the point of the game is this little alarm right here is randomly going to wake him up. And what happens when he wakes up is it goes from a serene game to an absolutely terrifying game. <laughs> so the first time that daddy wakes up, the stakes have been set, and you never want him to wake up again, right? But I think what happens whenever we're on we're in the middle of Turkey Day, is this is kind of the face that we make during Thanksgiving. It's like 364 days of the year, we're like, okay, everything is so good. Things are just kind of going past us. Then Turkey Day happens, and we're like, ah, there's so many things that I have to be thankful for, right? I have to do everything now. You don't. <laughs> you don't have to do everything now. Pace yourself. Pace yourself. Find some things that you can do to show appreciation and thankfulness and do them, commit to do them, right? So many times, so many times what happens is this is us all of the time, even on Thanksgiving Day sometimes, right? We just kind of go through life and, oh yeah, that person at Starbucks did that thing because that's what they're paid to do. And oh, the, the, that person at church did that thing because that's what they're paid to do even. Or that person over there did that. and blah, 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 blah. That's not a way to live, guys, you know? The problem that the guys in the passage had wasn't being thankful even. They were thankful. I guarantee you they were thankful. The problem was that they got a receipt from a transaction from the Savior, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, and they didn't do anything with it. They didn't do anything with it. That's a problem. So my challenge to you all is for you to count your receipts. How many receipts have you got? I, I already know one. <laughs> we, we talked about it this morning. We've talk, we talk about it every single week. You might have heard of him, Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins. You know, kind of a major thing, right? Kind of a major thing. That's a major receipt. That should prompt quite a bit of generosity within us, right? But then think, and this is where it gets mind-blowing, think of all the things that church people have done for you in your life that have gotten you to this point. Oh my God. Goodness, that, that, that's mystifying, right? It's just absolutely mystifying. Um, David Palmer, I owe him like a trillion dollars for carrying all the stuff up to my third floor apartment, you know? He won't take it, but I owe it to him, you know? Um, all the people that helped me get here, all the people that have helped me get to where I'm at, I mean, all the support that we all give each other whenever we go through really hard times, when stuff happens and we don't know what to do next, and this family's here, we've got receipts. We've got some receipts. Most receipts in America get thrown away. Most, most do, or at least I assume they do, because that's what I did with most of them, unless they're for business, of course. But count your receipts. 
Keep track of what people have done something, but here's the kicker, do something. That brother who did that thing for you a long time ago, call him up, whether it's my blood brother or church brother, right? That, that mom of yours who has given and given and given and given, call her up. It doesn't have to be Mother's Day to do that, <laughs> right? Call her up. Make sure she knows what's going on. Make sure she knows that you're thankful. The people that you run into every single day who work in fast food, Starbucks, whatever, right? The people that are just kind of doing a job and they just want to get through it, be thankful. Find a way to be thankful that's different than the person before you, right? Or the person after you. We as Christians have a unique opportunity to be thankful. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a person who his whole entire being prompt, should prompt us to thankfulness, I feel like, in Jesus, right? And this morning, if you, haven't, if you don't feel like you're a part of this family, if you don't feel like you're a part of this community, if you want to be a part of Jesus, if you want to be a part of what the kingdom of God is doing in the world, we want you to be a part of that. We want you to be invited into this, and we want you to feel as though you can say thank you. This morning, if you have any kind of need at all, we ask that you come this morning while we stand and while we sing.